Hi everyone, Aces Up here for PokerNerve.com, bringing you an online tournament review. It's the PokerStars 100 rebuy. Uh, being a rebuy and the 100 rebuy, there'll be good depth of stack and a lot of regular players. So it's going to work well as a more advanced review. Uh, if you do feel some parts are a little over your head, uh, make sure you check out my Sunday Millions review where I final tabled the Sunday Millions, which also has a lot of good strategy, but it's not quite as deep with the tactics. Uh, this review will see deep stack play, lots of post-flop decision making, and at times some sort of unorthodox and you know thinking outside of the box sort of strategy will pop up. Uh, because in these reg-infested tourneys, it's always good to have a few tricks up your sleeve. As far as rebuys go, generally uh, pressuring stacks and initiative and overall aggression is not really as key as it is in regular play because players know they have more bullets if they need them. Uh, and uh, they also generally like to get more involved in pots and speculate to try to win big pots, uh, you know, which is a good strategy and what you'll see and hear me talking about uh, during this rebuy period. Um, but at the same time, it's important not to overdo it and specifically overplaying just because you know you have rebuys up your sleeve if you need them. Uh, that's only going to be costing yourself money. Uh, you want to try to refrain from using too many rebuys because it's just going to affect your ROI. So you have to play smart. So here getting into it with the King Jack, we have the opportunity to do that. Uh, we have uh, cut off open 2.5x. Uh, I will just be using universal hand replayer for part one and then I'll be switching to the HUD as it gets a little bit uh, deeper into the tournament. I think if you're three betting more of a, if you're using more of a linear strategy, you're three betting a sort of more condensed range, lots of Jack Queens, King Jacks, Ace Tens uh, and all that sort of thing, you could consider three betting this. Along with the normal questions that you ask yourself when you're considering a three bet, how often does my opponent fold the three bets, which is obviously a function of his opening frequency and his, his playing style. And then along with that, post-flop, how often does he fold the C bets or do I have a skill edge post-flop? Uh, when you're thinking about three betting a linear range, of course, you want to be considering too, how often will he call, especially these days, players like to call three bets really wide. How often will he call with combinations that I dominate? Uh, in this case, he might because it is a rebuy period and we have good depth of stack. Uh, and so he might call with some 10 jacks, jack nine suited and king eight and king nine suited and king tens and stuff like that. But at the same time, I like to defend a lot from the big blind. And this is a hand that I'm happy to keep in uh, my big blind uh, defending range uh, versus steel as well. By just calling, we keep in a lot of worse hands anyway. Uh, and we just keep the pot a little bit more under control, which, as I said, is important. In the, you know, during the rebuy period in these sort of more marginal instances. We get an interesting flop where I think it fits a big blind's defending range really nicely, especially in the rebuy period. Uh, but even if it's in regular play, you know, I can be defending here with 3, 4, uh, 8, 9, 5, 6, 5, 7. So there's lots of two pair and straight combinations. Of course, we can have flush draws as well. I think this is a pretty good spot to check raise. I would probably check raise a reasonable with quite a high frequency actually here. And he has kind of bet on the large side, which is interesting. Although you could interpret it as being a little bit stronger, at the same time, it does sort of build the pot, and make it a little bit more enticing to try and hit him with a check raise here. There's 385 in there now. Uh, we could sort of check raise to, yeah, I mean, not we don't even have to make that large, I think here. I mean, we could make it sort of four, 450 or something like that. Uh, 480 and I, I think we can expect to get a lot of folds. It's probably a profitable play uh, We do I probably wouldn't do it if we didn't have the backdoor uh, Second nut flush and that's a little bit more enticing along with the overs uh, So I think that I'd probably check raise a, a reasonable frequency there But I didn't in this particular instance and part of the reason for that again is just because it is a rebuy period And I think that he might peel us a little bit lighter than he would at other times and also the depth of stack you know we don't really put him under much pressure he can sort of call and navigate post flop uh, it is important to note that if we did check raise on the flop we'd be doing it you know with a lot of uh with plans to try and represent lots of turn cards there's lots of straight completing cards and lots of flush competing cards that uh you know we have the opportunity to be bluffing on or if it's a heart semi bluffing on because we did have the king of hearts eight nine suited here this is a you know, a hand that I really like to be uh, playing in the rebuy period, especially. And uh, we are going to be out of position against a good player, though, Hescop. Uh, I go ahead and uh, 3x it. He calls. I generally 3x in the rebuy period just to create bigger pots uh, to give myself the opportunity, especially with hands like this, to uh, to win bigger pots should the opportunity arise. This looks like it 
might not be such an opportunity since uh, we don't really flop that well, although we do have a gutsa to the nuts uh, if we can hit a non-club 10. This is an interesting board, and these middling sort of wet boards, uh, I usually, you want to proceed pretty carefully with these boards. They do generally offer your opponents you know, a lot of ways to connect, but particularly with a jack and a 10, 9, 8, and 7, and 2-tone these are boards where you've got to be a little bit careful. Having said that, you know, I do want to, I think you do have to be a little bit careful about just giving up and making, you know, not putting up too much resistance. So in this sort of spot, I think C betting is fine. You've got to remember that you usually flop a pair around 33% of the time, flush draws around 12, flush or flush draws around 12, straights or straight draws around 11. So, you know, normally you're going to be C betting 55% ish. You know, plus you can get gutses and a few other overs with gutses or whatever, or some other overs with backdoors. So, I think sea betting. You see a lot of players. That's why you normally get sea betting percentages in the vicinity of sixty to sixty-five, um, just because players generally pick up equity a reason, you know, close to that sort of percentage anyway. Um, you've got to remember if you're betting too wide on this board, we're going to have a lot of hands in this situation. Is what I'm getting at, where we can fire, uh, and so. If I had a hand like Ace Deuce or King Five of Hearts or something, I'm probably just happy to give up. Otherwise, we're just going to be C betting way too much on this board, especially against a tough opponent out of position. So you've got to remember there's nothing wrong with giving up. But having said that, I, I just feel giving up here is a little bit too weak because we do have the gutsa. So uh, I go ahead and fire. You've got to remember too, an eight or nine is going to be good a lot of the time. Our opponent's blind defending range uh, in the rebuy period is going to be, we did 3x, but it's going to be quite loose. So I still expect to get enough folds for the bet here to be profitable. And like I said, we do have some equity anyway. Uh, but he actually... Uh, hits us with a raise here his raising range on this flop it's probably going to be fairly wide i think i think it's a pretty good board to attack on he might do it some of the time with some you know semi bluff with some threes like an ace three or three four maybe just because the board's likely to develop in such a way where he, he gets in some pretty tricky spots but he might have the best hand on the flop but then at times players also like to float with those sort of hands as well so it does kind of depend a lot on your opponent because he might float and then try and rep, you know, as the board develops, try and rep some things on later streets, which is always a nice play as well. So I, I, I guess for value, there's not really too many hands other than sort of King Jacks and things like that. He might go ahead and raise them for value, expecting some worse, you know, one pair of hands to call and some draws. But I think with the Gutsa, we're probably not ready to, at this stack depth and the fact that it is a rebuy period, are probably not quite ready to give up. But it's important to keep in mind that we're looking to represent on later streets and not just playing to hit a 10, potentially an 8 or a 9. And this is a pretty good card to do just that. I probably would like to have seen myself lead here. I do think we have some ace 3, ace 7, even ace jack would probably just call flop. And now I think that uh, I think it would be a pretty good spot to lead on. Uh, we could also have some nut flush draws. We probably don't want to get that in on the flop at this stack depth. Um most likely, but we could now lead on those. Uh, and so I think this isn't too bad a card to lead on and just put a little bit of pressure on the weaker parts of our opponent's flop raising range because it is very hard for us to call. I mean, we have to, the, the main reason is we're pretty much at the bottom of our flop calling range, the complete bottom, uh, other than maybe, I guess, if we, yeah, I don't even know if I'd call with four, five or five, six. So maybe of spades I would. So we're pretty close to the bottom of our range. And so that's why I think leading is not too bad. Having said that, it does check through, which is kind of good because it gives us an opportunity to pick up equity on the river, but also it presents an opportunity for us to bluff now. Uh, again, just going back to the range that I pointed out where we could have some two-pair combinations. Along with that, I would probably also uh, bet here for value with anything better than jack-queen. So we do have some jacks as well as an ace that uh, you know, we could be value betting two pair combos, which are all part of our range. Most of the weaker portion of our range, if our opponent is trying to weigh up the combos of value, our bluffing ratio with our value bets, I mean, we could have some gutses just like we have, or I guess hands like four, six of clubs and things like that, uh, or uh, queen eight of clubs and things like that. So, you know, it puts, I think that if we were gonna bluff, we need to be sizing up a bit to put pressure on the weaker part of our opponent's range. The board has developed reasonably well for us to be doing that. I mean, we could even have something like 5-7, I guess. Uh, and so, 
since the, if I was value betting, I'd probably be value betting a little bit on the larger side. Uh, I need to be bluffing a little bit larger too, well, vice versa even. Uh, we don't want to be betting small as a bluff here, I think, because uh, I just think that uh, just in case our opponent does have that weaker part of his range, if he has a hand like 6-7 here that decided just to raise the flop to try and get pot control to check back turn, uh, and hopefully he wanted to win the pot a lot just initially before the board got any worse, uh, I think that... Uh, it's not unlikely that he might play it that way. He might do that some of the time. And if that's the case, it does put those sorts of hands, I think, under a lot of pressure. It'd be pretty hard to call with anything less than a jack here. Uh, if he has... Uh, yeah, I mean, he could even, I guess, have something like sixes and just raise flop with it rather than just going to call mode. Um, depending on how he plays, I feel I have a pretty good read on this guy. But I think players' strategies, especially even in the rebuy period, um, they can do a few funky things. Uh, but he does fold there, so we got away with that uh, with that bluff. You know, I, I don't think we're too disproportional there, though, with our, with our frequencies, so, you know. Ace-King here, 3x, and, you know, you see me normally, sometimes in regular play, I'll just min. I do that for a lot of different reasons. Uh, anything from, uh, you know, payout structures to if I'm multi-tabling to just the opponents and stack depth behind. Uh, but generally, like I said, in rebuys, you'll see me mostly 3xing. Ace-10 here in the big blind, and we can see three players have already entered the pot. I think actually this is a pretty good spot to squeeze. Uh, there's already 420 in there. We could pop this up to about 520. It only has to work 55% of the time. I think it probably does. If Psycho Agromore, the player who is on the button, jams once we squeeze we can always just call off because he's fairly short we'd be getting a good, a good price to do that if we did uh, jack it up to something like sort of 520 ish or you know 580 even uh, i think that if we can get hescop to fold most of the time these players behind are going to have pretty wide ranges and they're just going to give up we do have a hand you know that's pretty strong with a couple of decent blockers uh well the ace obviously particularly but i just think that hescop He's a little bit on the loose side, and in the rebuy period especially, he's likely to be playing even looser. Uh, and I, I think that as much as I did say before, you need to be smart and pick your spots in the rebuy period, I think this is actually a pretty good spot just to pick up some dead money. You want to be a little bit too careful. I think the players are a little bit too reluctant there to squeeze, and a lot of the times they just get swept up in the pot odds and say, hey, I can call here and close the action and get a really good price. But I think it, it's not necessarily the best play, even though I have done that in this instance. Uh, I think I would have preferred to have seen a squeeze there. And this is part of the reason why as well, is you get yourself in this tricky instance uh, where we've got a bet and a call and our hand is not really strong enough to raise and uh, is a little bit too strong to fold. So I think that we have to just call and see how the board develops. Obviously, we're hitting a, a 10 is the gin card. A club may or may not give us some potential to make the best hand on the river. Uh, but, you know, these players can be in there I mean, the button player could even have 2-4, you know, I mean, he suited, you know, he might even be calling that wide once he's on the button and he sees those those uh, two players already in ahead of him and it is a rebuy period. Having said that, he hasn't taken the initial rebuy, the top up, where you can get your stack up to 4,000. So he is only on the half stack of 2,000. Usually players who don't top up, usually the players that top up to 4,000 have uh, sort of intentions to play more hands because they have more depth of stack. They can get away with it, better implied odds and all that sort of thing. So... He might not necessarily be calling, you know, 2-4 suited may be going a little bit too far, but certainly 4-6 suited I, he could have, which would now be a straight. We do see the uh, player who bet flop again fire. Uh, I think that he can have ace-3 and ace-5 in his range, ace-3, ace-5 suited, I think he calls with. He could have, like I said, 4-6. He could have pocket threes or fives. Uh, Ace-jack and even just calling ace-queen is not out of the question. He might not necessarily three bet that pre-flop. Ace-king I'd feel he'd be more inclined to, but even that's not out of the question. So I think at this point, once it gets called behind, uh, we just have the, the best hand very rarely. We could be drawing very thin indeed. So I decided just to fold here. Um, the board ran out with a king and it's a bet and a fold. So perhaps the button player had the good sense to fold on the river or maybe he was flushing. Uh, we'd like to have seen what the uh, what got to give had there, but uh, unfortunately we won't get to. Just going to jump ahead here in orbit. Just over an orbit later, we've got the queen 10 off in this small blind. I go ahead and raise familiar situation Hescop defends pretty standard so far I do use a limping strategy in the small blind but I think during the rebuy period and this stack depth 
uh, I'm happy to go ahead and continue raising. I will talk a lot more about limping and I'll be doing a lot of limping later using it. Uh, yeah, just uh, I'll talk more about limping strategy a little bit uh, in a few parts when it does start to pop up regularly. Uh, but for now, you can see that we flopped middle pair. This is sort of a traditional checking spot. This is one of those boards I just talked about before where you do have sort of two two cards in that playing zone uh, that uh, you know your, your players are likely to be sort of holding a lot of the time combinations that can connect with this board in some way. Queen eight and seven, you know, seven eights and you know, king jacks and nine tens and all that sort of thing. Uh, I think that because my C betting is normally pretty high, I C bet with a frequency generally around 70%, just over 73% to date, but I've just cut it back a little bit recently, but it's a pretty high frequency. So I can probably get away with C betting a little bit wider with some more value hands since I am c-betting with a lot of some more marginal hands. So I think this is a, a hand that I could put into a c-betting, you know, into my c-betting range here pretty comfortably. But at the same time, I think checking is okay as well. Uh, and uh, just strengthening the the check calling range that I might have. It does turn a hand a little bit face up when we just check call here, I think. You know, I guess, yeah, ace queen and ace king might check call as well, but most of the time we're going to have a 10 or maybe sort of a medium pocket pair. So I'm pretty close here. I think probably just betting flop is is probably okay, but you know, checking as well is 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 okay depending on your opponent thinking from an exploitive point of view. If he's over if he's over stabbing this flop, if we think he's over stabbing, then probably there's more merit I think to check calling. Uh, once he checks back. There's a little bit more now the board has developed where you could have some flush draws that can give us some value. He might now be inclined to call with some, you know, fives that he check flop with or some worse tens like 910 or 710 if he did happen to check that on the flop. I think he probably bets those, but he may just check uh, to pot control and get value on later streets. But he could have some flushes, even hands like ace two, ace four and four six that he could be in there with could give us some value, I guess. So I think it's time just to protect and try and get some value, but he just folded. And, uh, you know, that that's not a bad play. I probably did be delayed C-betting there with a, with a lot of hands as well. So not too bad to have that sort of hand that's got some strength in our delayed C-betting range. Folding that one, I'm just going to skip ahead a few hands here to where we've got the king two suited and we're on the button. Uh, I gen generally, I did say I'll be 3xing a lot, but I think on the button, I still want to mostly be min-raising. And the big blind does defend again. It's, it's just like, seems like it's us against Hescop every hand. And funnily enough, it's actually going to be uh, the two of us playing heads up in this tournament, ultimately. So, so we're off to a good start here, battling a lot, which is which is always fun. And he's a strong reg. So, you know, it's always, uh, it's good uh, to be involved in pots with him. And it's always uh, entertaining. So the King 2 here on the monotone board, I think that uh, we might as well go ahead and bet here. You got to be a little bit careful checking back here. This is a board, like I said, I do see bet with a high frequency. If I start checking checking back top pairs in this board, it's very easy for my bets to become really unbalanced. Where all of a sudden, you know, I'm just c betting here with like queen nine of hearts. Uh, I do think we get a lot of immediate folds on this sort of board because it is fairly dry. I mean, barring the fact that he he doesn't, you know, presuming he doesn't have a diamond, I mean, we're going to get just get a lot of folds. We do also do block top pair. Uh, I think that I'm pretty happy to bet here. Uh, if he does have a medium strength hand, like uh, if he, even if he has like a four five or pocket sixes or something like uh, ace nine with a nine of diamonds or queen nine with a diamond, he might feel compelled to call flop here. We can get a little bit of value from some hands. We protect our hand at the same time and uh, just keep our you know, c-betting range on this particular type of board a little bit stronger rather than uh, making it a little bit too polar where we're only betting sort of with air and, um, you know, flushes and that sort of thing and, and big hands. So I, I just bet there and we take it down. So I think that's fine. This other hand, I think, relates back a little bit to something I was just saying a bit earlier about how you do want to get involved with speculative hands and that sort of thing, but you don't want to overdo it with sort of pushing the aggression. I think in regular play, this is a pretty good spot to go ahead and three bet because we get pretty good leverage against uh, Ernest AG, who is a, a regular player here. We get pretty good leverage against his stack. It's pretty hard for a player to four bet behind without a, a good value holding because of the stack depths that are involved. And uh, I think that it's not a bad play. But having said that, in the rebuy period, 
just calling behind and trying to enter the pot for a fairly affordable price, even though the implied odds aren't super because he's only got another 2,100 behind. It does also encourage some players to enter the pot behind, and 7-8 suited is a hand that plays fairly well multi-way, so I don't mind my call behind here. I think it's okay in a rebuy period, but I think it is fairly rebuy specific. At this stack depth, you want to be a little bit careful calling with a suited connected this low in regular play against this particular stack depth, I think. Uh, it's getting sort of marginal. But certainly in a rebuy period, it's fine. And this is also quite a fine flop. Uh, we flop the backdoor flush with the up and down. Uh, we're at the bottom end, obviously. Our opponent checks. He probably fears this type of board, just the way I was saying before, uh, where this is a type of board. We've got these two connected cards in the playing zone of what an opponent is very often going to be holding. And in this case, we are. Uh, and so I think that he actually just check gives up a lot with ace highs and some small pairs and, and worse. Uh, he might have some king highs and so forth as well, where he's just decided he's going to give up on this board. I don't really think that he's going to be check raising too much on this board. I actually check raise a lot of flops, uh, even uh, even when I had the initiative, but I'll talk more about that. We'll see some of that later as well. Um, but I think in this case, most of the time, he's going to be c-betting king jack, king queen, jack queen, flush draws, pairs, and that sort of thing. Uh, most of the time, I think he's just going to take the traditional route and c-bet those. So it seems like we've got kind of a, a green light. And so I just go ahead and bet here and uh, expect to take it down. If he does call, I mean, this is a really good hand to be betting because we only have eight high. And so it's really good to be pushing our, our semi bluffs here with this sort of hand where we can make better hands fold. Like if he had, you know, if he had uh, king eight of clubs, I mean, getting that sort of hand that had good equity against us to fold is a real bonus when we have a hand, uh, you know, it's just a traditional semi bluffing spot, I guess, really. But uh, it's just important to, to note there that we do want to be betting and not just checking back. A few hands later, we have pocket kings and... We get an early-ish raise. Well, not really early because you know, obviously we're six-handed, so effectively hijack and it's Hescop again. <laughs> it's Hescop again. Uh, you know, if it was a full ring and it's an early raise, a lot of the time I just flat here. I like to keep my flatting range because I defend the big blind really wide. Uh, I like to just keep a lot of big pairs like this in my flatting range for deception. Also, if you are three-betting, especially against early raises, generally you're doing that with a pretty polarized range. Most of your value hands are going to be pretty tight in that instance. And so it does sort of turn your hand face up. So I just generally call with a lot of my big hands as well against early raises. Having said that, this is not really a time to be doing that because we've got Hescop who, you know, opens with a reasonable range. Uh, and uh, the fact that it is a rebuy might entice him to, to call a little bit wider in position than he might normally. And so I think just trying to get value with a big hand and, you know, if we're lucky, we might cooler him and that sort of thing as well. He might have a hand like Jack's and we get a nice eight high flop or something. So just trying to build the pot. Uh, but unfortunately, he did fold. So we're just over start stack and uh, pocket nine. So we'll see if we can increase on that stack depth right now. Uh, obviously, a really good spot with the blinds both being this deep to have a hand like pocket nines. I go ahead and min again on the button. Hescop three X's is... It might as well be a heads up already. I just realized how many hands I'm actually playing against this guy. It's amazing. Uh, and so, I mean, this is, again, going back to what I was saying about rebuy strategy, you want to be careful here. I think I see a lot of players four bet in this spot and they're just like, hey, I open on the button. He's just playing big blind. Uh, you know, we've been tangoing a lot already. There's a bit of meta game going on. He probably thinks I'm stealing. He can be three betting pretty wide. Uh, let's just go ahead and four bet and get stacks in here. We're really deep to be getting nines in here. Yes, you know, a lot of the time he can have ace, king and ace, queen and stuff like that. But at the same time, I, I think that it's a bit of a spew in a rebuy period just to sort of overplay your hand because you know you can rebuy. And we don't want to be four bet folding, especially a hand this strong. We have such a nice price to call in position. Uh, and uh, even though he can, he can be getting a little bit out of line. But like I said before, I think he's pretty well aware of rebuy play as well. And he doesn't want to get too crazy on us because he knows we're going to be calling we're going to be calling fairly wide in position, uh, trying to make his life awkward post-flop. So I don't think he gets too out of line at this stack depth in a rebuy period against us. I think his three-betting range is mostly, mostly going to have a value component, which is good because nine ball on the flop. We flop middle set and our opponent leads into us. I, I guess this is a board that really favors his range because he can have hands like He's more inclined to have nines, even though we do have nines in this instance. Kings, of course, he can have. Ace, king, aces. Uh, they're the stronger parts of his range. We don't really have as many of those hands, especially the ace, king, aces, and kings combos. He probably expects to four bet them most of the time pre-flop. And so our stronger holdings are hands like sets of twos and potentially nines. 
and king queen and king jack so he probably has a range a range advantage in this instance given that fact and this board texture there's not really much incentive to be raising there isn't that many hands that i would raise with on this flop uh, another important thing to note on this flop is we actually started with an SPR of around six. And so as a general rule, when you have an SPR of five, you can generally bet half pot flop, half pot turn. And by the river, you've got sort of a under pot size bet remaining where you can get stacks in. We start this one at uh, SPR six. So stacks can e pretty easily get in by the river with bet, bet, bet. And being in position, we have the opportunity where we can always force extra bets into the pot if we want to. We don't want to fold out the weaker part of Hescop's range here with a raise. Uh, we don't have, like I said, much of a raising range. Uh, 10 jack of diamonds, pocket deuces, a king nine, uh, ace eight of diamonds, ace five of diamonds, hands like that, all hands that I might call with. Even a jack queen with a diamond where we can have a gutser with a backdoor flush. I mean, these are all hands that I'd probably just call with. I generally like to have all options available on most board textures. That is, I like to have a raising range, a calling range, and obviously we're always going to have a folding range in there somewhere. But uh, on this particular board, I must admit, this is one of those board types in this particular instance where it favors our opponent's range and we are in position and we have a hand this strong. I mean, a lot of the times in these boards, I don't have many hands that I would raise with. And so I think just calling is the is the way to go here, especially, as I said, with the SPR of six. Having said that, <laughs> it's a nice turn card. Uh, having said that, uh, I probably would raise a lot of turn cards with flush draws. So there's more merit, I think, to potentially raising the turn just because it gets more aggressive dead money in there when Hescop is barreling. And certainly, you know, I pointed out the stronger parts of his range, but there are some weaker parts as well where he can have ace 10 and ace jack and ace queen and things like that. He probably knows that he has a range advantage in this instance. He probably thinks that he can fold out hands where we might have eight, nine suited. Uh, we could hand some float flop, I guess, with some sevens and some gut shots, you know, 10 jack and jack queen or hands we can have. So there's certainly a lot of merit for him to be double barreling in this instance. So I would probably take a hand like ace 10, 10 jack of diamonds uh, and just uh, go ahead and shove them on the turn. We got we have outs, uh, especially if we have the ace high where we block the ace king and ace combinations. I think there'd be more merit to potentially shoving that hand on the turn. Uh, but, you know, that that's more of a semi-bluffing range that's going to be you know, shoving turn. I don't know how many value hands we have. I mean, king, queen, I would probably still proceed with calling. So I guess our turn range is probably a little bit semi-bluff heavy. That, With that in mind, I mean, you could argue for shoving a hand like this uh, just, just to keep sort of some strong hands in there as well. But it's just such a good spot to let our opponent barrel off. I mean, we just virtually have the nuts. Uh, barring the unfortunate instance where he ha happens to actually have pocket kings, which, you know, as we pointed out, he could. Uh, the river board runs out and he shoves. I mean, obviously we're calling, but just to have a quick think about his range and how the queen might alter his range. The queen is the queen is probably probably a little bit well, I mean, if we had a king anyway, we we're probably calling. So even though we have king queen a fair bit in this instance, uh, I don't think that uh, the queen is necessarily a big deal because in a rebuy period with getting this price now where we only have 2,700 behind, there's 3,500 in there plus his bet that he's fired out now effectively our stack size 2,700. We're getting really good pot odds. And so I think with these pot odds, we'd probably be calling down with the king a lot of the time. Uh, yeah, I guess we probably would be. So it really, I really feel like he gives up a lot once he fires turn and we call. He's going to know that most of our range consists of, uh, you know, kings and strong hands like we have. So I just don't see him bluffing this river very often. Uh, and I don't see him playing queens this way. I think that he probably would have checked the turn, maybe even started with a check on the flop, but probably bet flop check turn is probably the more traditional line to take with queens, especially since queens would block some of those gutters that we might have. Uh, he might check and... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of close, but I don't think he has queens very often. It looks like he's just got ace-king, I guess, or aces. But um, like I said, I mean, obviously, we're just calling. But it's just a good idea anyway to think about your opponent's range and, and, and what he might be playing, how he might be playing his range in that spot. It really looked like ace-king or aces, didn't it? Uh, and that is a big pot, which gives us a great stack to work with. And once the other players top up and get add-ons as the rebuy period concludes shortly... This really paves the way for some interesting poker. So I really hope you can join me for the following parts. You can find them on YouTube. They're in the Pokernerve VIP channel. You'll find a bunch of reviews in there for all levels, 
regular live streams, and recently the bankroll challenge I completed turn 2K into $40,000 in two months, the Build a Bankroll Challenge, check that out too. It's all in there and exceptional value for under $15 a month. So if you're keen on your poker and if you'd like to win more playing, come along and check it out. I hope to see you there. This has been Aces Up for PokerNerve.com. Thanks for watching.